So now we're going to do chapter 16, and for this one here you need to do questions 1 to 15, and we're looking at temperature regulation as well as water balance in animals. So temperature and water balance, we're going to start looking at animals before we move on to plants, and there's a few things that you need to remember. So you need to remember that transpiration is the evaporation of water from the underside of leaves, which then pulls more water up the xylem of the plant. And that vascular plants are ones that have that phylum and xylem. So we're going to look at temperature and water balance in these particular plants. So it is the evaporation of the water that's inside those leaves that causes the cooling of the leaves, that while at the same time pulls more water from the roots of the plant up towards the leaves of the plant for photosynthesis. And the rate of transpiration is regulated by the degree of opening of the stomata. So you should remember that when the stomata are open, transpiration can occur. When the stomata are closed, transpiration can't occur. So the amount that, the, that those stomata are open is really going to influence how much water you're going to be losing from those leaves and how cool it needs to keep it. So plants that are in hot and dry environments have adaptations that allow lower levels of transpiration to conserve water. So that would mean that the, the drawing up of the water through the plant xylem would be more efficient so that they don't rely too much on transpiration because they need to save that water because they're living in environments where rain is less common. So that's another way that they balance their water. So let's have a look at uh, thermoregulation. So thermo meaning temperature, regulation meaning trying to keep it the same or regulating how high or how low it goes. And we're going to be looking at animals here. So regulation of body temperature has a negative feedback pathway and it's under homeostatic control. So homeostatic is just a nominalized version of homeostasis. So we're wanting to keep it around that 37 degrees Celsius mark and homeostasis is going to try and keep that there. Negative feedback means if we're cold, we're going to make ourselves hot. And if we're hot, we're going to make ourselves cold. Remember, positive feedback is where we're going to make something stronger. So if we were cold, we'd want to be colder. But in this case, we don't want that. So temperature is regulated by negative feedback. And it is something that we uh, use homeostatic control measures for. So the control center for measuring body temperature is the hypothalamus, which is this section here of the brain. And this process operates with many inputs and outputs for effector responses. So in order to maintain temperature, we're looking at a lot of different effector responses that we can have. You need to make sure you remember what homeostasis is, and that is the stable internal environment in the face of changing conditions in the external environment. So for sensing these temperature changes, we've got two major sources. The first one being skin, the second one being blood. So uh, the skin is able to detect both heat and cold, and then it triggers a nervous system that action potential response to it. As the blood passes through the hypothalamus, that's where it's able to detect uh, changes in the blood temperature. If it's so, if it's too hot or too cold, it's going to trigger that homeostasis response by going through the hypothalamus. So either your skin's going to detect it and send a nerve response by those skin receptors, or the blood's going to go through the hypothalamus, telling the hypothalamus that it's too hot or too cold, and then you're going to get that response. So let's have a look at one of those response systems. So here we're looking at a decrease, so a drop in the temperature that's outside, and it's going to be picked up by detectors in the skin. So from that, we have several different responses that we could have as a result of it being cold. So the first one would be to put on more clothes, which then decreases the amount of heat that we're losing from the body, and then reduces that stimulus and then the response slowly ceases. So that telling us that we're cold is slowly going to go away. The second one is to constrict blood vessels, which again is going to decrease heat loss, reduce the stimulus, and then if it's sufficient, it's going to stop it. If it's insufficient, then we're going to go back and tell, uh, tell, tell us again that we're not warm enough yet, so we need to get warmer. 
The third one would be to move inside. And again, it's either going to reduce the stimulus. And if it doesn't, we're going to come up with a different strategy. The next one would be to start shivering or increasing your movement. So you might start fidgeting and that increases the heat that we make internally. So our metabolic heat and that reduces the stimulus. And again, it's either going to slowly stop that response or increase uh, the temperature is either not going to increase, which means the receptors need to be triggered again. You've got increase in metabolism, so increasing the amount of reactions going on within your body. Or number six, which is to raise the skin, raise skin hairs. Now, we don't have very much hair on our skin, most of us, so it's going to have very little effect uh, on humans. But on other animals that have a lot more hair, raising their hair is going to have a much greater effect. They're going to be able to trap more warm air around their bodies. So the hypothalamus, which we talked about before in terms of uh, detecting the, the changes and those kinds of things. So when the temperature change is de detected by that hypothalamus, it then sends a message to the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is just this lower part here of the whole hypothalamus. So it's this little gangly bit that hangs down. And it releases the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is TSH. TSH then sends a message to your thyroid gland. So that hormone, so the hypothalamus, sends a message to the pituitary gland, which secretes a hormone that goes to the thyroid gland. Now this is your trachea. So this is in your throat, and your thyroid sits to the left and the right of your throat which triggers the release of thyroxine. And thyroxine causes an increase in your metabolism, which can then raise the body temperature, or a decrease in thyroxine, which can reduce the metabolism rate and lower the body's temperature. So here we've got our hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus then sends a message to the pituitary gland, which then sends the message to the thyroid gland. So for these arrows here, what I would like you to do is draw this chart out into your book and label the messages that are going from one to the next. So when we're losing heat, if you're too hot, uh, you need to try and get rid of some of that heat. So we looked at when you're too cold and generating heat, and now we're going to look at being too hot and needing to lose heat. So we can increase sweating so that we can lose heat via the water and we can have evaporation happening. We talked about vasodilation previously, lowering those skin hairs and reducing the metabolic rate. So that is the lowered thyroxine level from the thyroid gland. If we're looking at gaining heat, so we wanna keep ourselves warm, you've got that vasoconstriction, uh, reduced sweating, raising the skin hairs, shivering, and increasing the metabolic rate. So the vasoconstriction, this one here is when those veins are quite small, and you can see to the right of that, when they're dilated, they become a lot larger. So moving from temperature, we're now going to have a look at osmoregulation. Osmo meaning water, so we're going to look at balancing the amount of water inside of an animal. So the physiological systems of animals from cells to organs, we need that fluid environment for them. For every system to function properly, it needs to have that water so that we can have uh, the solutes maintaining their balance both internally and externally, allowing for that active transport and passive transport uh, and osmosis to be occurring. And then we're looking at how animals regulate those solute concentrations and the balance of that gain and the loss of water that's termed osmoregulation. So this last dot point here, that is your definition of osmoregulation. So it is regulating the solute con concentrations and the balance of the gain and the loss of water in order to do that. So the maintenance of the osmotic and water potential in a cell or inside of a living organism. That is the technical scientific definition of osmoregulation. So balancing the level of salt with the level of water. So similar to thermoregulation, we need to make sure that we're balancing the gain and the loss of water. This really depends on uh, the water uptake and the amount of solutes. 
So the osmoregulation is largely done through the controlled movement of solutes between the internal and external environment. So here we're talking about inside of a cell versus outside of a cell. And we're going to be moving things from the inside to the outside and from the outside to the inside to help balance the level of water and the level of solutes. Remembering that osmosis is the process of diffusion of water. So it's the movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. So from an area where there's a lot of water with less solutes to an area where there's less water and high solutes. So you're trying to balance out the water levels and re relative to the, the other compounds that it contains. So it occurs whenever two solutions are selected by are separated by a membrane and they have different osmolarity, so different osmotic pressure, different amounts of solutes on either side of that membrane. And the water is going to move from high osmolarity to low osmolarity. So in this uh, image that you can see on the right hand side here, it's going to move from the left side to the right side, balancing out that osmolarity. So then we also rely on excretion, so the removal of excess wastes and ions so that we're able to maintain that water balance, but also to remove any excess water that we don't really require. So all living cells function and they make things that we don't need. So this is those wastes that I was talking about removing. And if they're not going to be removed, then our functions are going to be depleted. So we're not going to be able to do things the way that we were able to do them before. So we need to get rid of those excess waste products. And that's really essential for that osmoregulation. If I've got too much salt, I need to get rid of it. If I've got too much uh, byproduct waste from cellular respiration, I need to get rid of that. Okay, and where this happens is in the kidney. And you should remember this from when we did body systems. So looking at the mammalian kidney, You've got the two basic processes. You've got the filtration and then that reabsorption. So the filtration is where you remove some of the components by the blood flowing through the kidney and they're pushed out into the kidney tubules and then uh, only the small things, so like water and such, can be filtered through. Okay, so the large proteins and cells that cannot pass through the filter, they're going to remain in the blood. So everything else is all going to get passed through the kidney and then go through this filtration process. The second one is reabsorption and we discussed this when we did the kidneys that most of that filtrate is going to be reabsorbed so that salt, glucose, amino acids, water are all going to be reabsorbed and half or less of the urea we're going to be reabsorbing as well. So we need to reabsorb all of these things because we need glucose to be able to function, we need amino acids, and we need salts in the, in the function of our nervous system, for example. And so we rely on glucose by coming back in by active transport against the concentration gradient, and then water goes through the osmotic gradient so that it's able to be reabsorbed uh, through the loop of Henle. So homeostasis via excretion, really we're relying on excretion to be able to help us keep our water levels balanced. And the important uh, hormone that is responsible for this is ADH, antidiuretic hormone. You need to make sure that you know that ADH is the one that's that is important to regulating water balance in particularly us. So ADH is produced in the hypothalamus, which we talked about before, which was that control center of responses to stimulus. And then ADH is stored and released from that pituitary gland. So ADH is produced by the hypothalamus and then it gets stored in the pituitary gland for when it is needed. And we've got osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus and they monitor the osmolarity of the blood. So as the blood passes through the hypothalamus, it's either going to say our water levels are fine or they're not fine and we need to do something about it. And then the hypothalamus will then start secreting this ADH depending on what we need to be doing. So just so that you know, uh, this uh, mosmil, mosm per liter 
the definition of all of that is at the bottom of this slide. So when osmolarity rises above the levels that we're happy with, we're going to start releasing more ADH into the bloodstream and this is going to make its way to the kidneys. Uh, here, its main target in the kidneys are going to be the distal tubules. Remember these ones here are the ones that are further away. Proximal meaning close, distal meaning further away. Those distal tubules, the collecting ducts, which are the ones on the far right hand side here, <coughs> where the hormones increase the permeability to water. So they're going to be able in, enabling more water to either enter or leave. And it, in this case, it's going to amplify water reabsorption, which reduces urine volume. So if we release ADH, we're going to be taking water out at this distal, uh, out of the in surrounding the environment into our uh, the capillaries that are around these tubules so we're going to be reabsorbing water and taking them out reducing the amount of water in urine if we have less ADH so if the hypothalamus is triggered to say that uh, we've got too much water for example we're going to release less ADH and we're going to be keeping more water into these distal tubules and the collecting ducts there are some exam questions that I have gone through and you'll find these in the voice PowerPoint that is in the OneNote and also on Compass. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to put them here. So if you head to Compass or your OneNote, you'll find about five multiple choice questions that I've deconstructed over there for you.